Good. Come on and sit up front here and we'll get going. I'm John Henry, Chairman of the Committee for the Republic, and tonight is um, our first uh, event this uh, in the new season, in the 2023-2024 season will go from this month all the way through next May and then we'll take off the summer again. Um, we do two things. We, we have whole salons once a month, and we also give uh, the Bender Liberty Award. And tonight, we're giving the Bender Liberty Award to Gar Alperin, who Gar wrote. Um, I met Gar years ago with his wife at dinner with him. He's very, um, very mild-mannered. We small. don't talk okay. about this, this at all. This is the big one. Yeah, I'm going to start with the first one. <laughs> So in 1965, Gore wrote uh, Atomic Diplomacy, Hiroshima and Potsdam, and laid out his thesis that, um, and we'll get into this in great detail, but uh, basically that uh, dropping the uh, two atomic bombs in Japan uh, was really not the last act of the, of the uh, Second World War. It was really the first act of the Cold War. And so the, he, he basically laid his thesis out, and then um, uh, this was, was dropped in, in, in August 1945, so in 50 years later, in 1995, Gar was able to get all these amazing documents that came out, and I mean, still, some are still um, classified, but he, he got this tre treasure chose. So this is probably one of the most interesting books I've ever read on American foreign policy. And uh, he came out in 1995, called The Decision to Use the Atomic Bomb. And then Bruce and I, we read it, and we, we, couldn't, we couldn't believe it, um, uh, how uh, compelling it was, because uh, we know that governments lie. Uh, well, to be more specific, uh, empires lie. I don't think republics do. But, um, so we'll go through a lot of those lies tonight, and uh, we can go back and forth on the lies. But uh, we'll jump into the, uh, Bruce is going to, going to carry the, um, uh, the, lay the evidence out uh, that Gar does in the book. But I just would say that in terms of the Defender of Liberty Awards, um, we give it to journalists, uh, Cy Hirsch for um, Eli Abagrab, the Jewels, uh, we held that for him on Nordstrom. Uh, uh, we get it to the uh, reports from the Knight Ritter uh, on the uh, Iraq War, uh, the weapons of mass destruction lies. The, we've given it to uh, NSA whistleblowers, um, uh, Bill Benny and Tom Drake and others. We've given it to people who stood up in the Bush administration on torture, John Kiriakou and Alberta Mora. Anyway, the list is, look, we've, we've given it to only one congressman, Walter Jones, and Bruce and I went to his funeral, and I think, uh, you know, I don't think we would have done that if, if he had been the, the best person in Congress on, on the war power. And um, we're going to, next month, we're going to give it to Ron Paul, who is in that same category. Um, so, there are many other, uh, what we've given about, um, Rand Paul's going to attend his father's um, uh, event here uh, end of October, and uh, his staff asked for who's gotten this award, so we went back, and it was over two dozen people, so I won't go through all of them now, but, um, so one of them, uh, we gave it to Dan Ellsberg in, um, on the 50th anniversary, not of the New York Times publishing the uh, Pentagon Papers, but on the 50th anniversary uh, to, uh, end of, uh, in the summer, end of June, in uh, uh, two years ago. And, you know, it's not an accident that Gar, it turns out, was very close to Dan Ellsberg and was uh, organizing when, when the uh, Injunction when they shut down the New York Times, it then went to the Post, and I think there were how many newspapers? There was all these newspapers all over the country, and Gar was the one who was working with Dan to, to 
why these get these doc get the Pentagon Papers documents so the stories would keep coming. And um, but the difference between Ellsberg and Gar is that Ellsberg was a government employee and, and, and took the those documents to uh, I, it was <clears throat> the only job I wanted when I got a Harvard College was to work for Fulbright because he had the hearings on the Vietnam War. It was two years ago. It was a great disappointment for me to learn that Dan Ellsberg had taken it to Fulbright and he turned it down. And he took it to McGovern and he turned it down. And he took it to uh, yeah, Taylor Nelson, Nelson and, and Matthias. And, Mathias, and you know. Pete McCloskey. And then on the high side, Pete McCloskey was still so. So, um, and under the speech, the speech and debate clause, any, any congressman, senator can declassify anything. So anyway, in Gar's case, he didn't work for the government, but basically he penetrated this propaganda that has existed about how the atomic bomb. And, and the basic line of argument is that if we hadn't dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that basically this invasion, uh, we would have had to invade um, uh, Kushu and, and then later the mainland of uh, Honshu. And we, would have lost a million solid in the million dollar million number. So, and I've had, you know, friends tell me, oh well, my dad was on a ship and he was headed to you know, he was headed over there for the invasion, so we're happy we dropped the bomb. So it is um so anyway, we're gonna get into the evidence on that and, and um and so far as a now in terms of the difference, it, 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 I think that's the difference, right? That that he was not uh, so we're giving it to Gar because and let me let me do it right now. And instead, of Gar, unfortunately, Gar, Gar has some uh, health issues, and uh, which would enable and it isn't the flu. So it, it, it's not a question of we we decided not to put it off because uh, he deserves it, and we want to go forward. So on the uh, Gar, uh, we're going to give this to Gar, and it says courage. Is the first virtue that makes all the other virtues possible. So, without courage, none of the others are possible. So, it all comes back to courage. So, here, here, let's have a big, big deal. <laughs> here, here. Thank you, Mark. I think that um, Daniel Ellsberg confronted criminal prosecution, which um, guard not, but he confronted something that can be equally traumatizing, namely. The risk of ostracism. Because I would wager that in the United States, ever since World War II, 99% of the American people believe that the bombs saved 2 million American lives. And to suggest that it was a war crime, it shows how unpatriotic you are, a military industrial complex will come get you and try to destroy you. Uh, and it took a lot of courage to go after the military industrial complex. And they sold this message in part through George Bundy, having Henry Stimson's memoirs kind of revised to conceal the fact that Japan was ready to surrender as long as Hirohito could maintain some ornamental status, which exactly we permitted him to do after we dropped the bomb, but not before because we wanted to send a message to the Soviet Union, you need to get out of Eastern and Central Europe and don't come in and fight the war against Japan because we want to control the aftermath. Uh, so, Gar had took huge risk. Uh, it takes guts to take on the military industrial complex. As I can guarantee you, they will pull out everything under the sun, send spies after you, plant uh, defamatory statements. I know they were going after Walter Jones, you know, can try, trying to find people who would oppose him. So that's why I think people like Gar are especially important because there are so few checks on the military industrial security complex. Congress doesn't do its job anymore. They don't have any, they don't have hearings anymore. They don't ask questions. They don't even insist on their subpoenas being compliant. So we're living in the dark. We have no clue really what's going on in Ukraine. Really what's happening to the weapons? How much money is really there? Congress doesn't hold any hearings. They say, how much money you want? Okay, we'll give it to you. That's all that happens. So that's why people like Gar are so critical. Because they're the only ones that permit some sunshine in to what the government is doing on really serious things, like dropping atomic bombs and committing war crimes. 
and making it and taking the foreign policy out of the ability of the United States to affect by being informed what's going on. It's all secret. And it takes great courage to take on you know, such an overwhelming force you know, in the United States politics. And that's why and you can see today, there's no, no, not an inch of difference between the Republicans and Democrats when it comes to the military industrial security complex. Both of them agree. If there's a government shutdown, there's one department that doesn't get affected. Yeah. You know what? The Defense Department. Others get 8%, food stamps go, then operas go. But no, those weapons, no, we're still going to go after them. The napalm, whatever else. Obviously, the weapons are the still going to be produced. Right? The debt ceiling deal. Yeah, the debt ceiling deal. Exempted the trade and a half dollars. Of, uh, yeah, the military industrial complex. So that's why that's important. But if we could begin now, I think the main message that Gar's books conveys is that the decision to drop the atomic bomb was a political decision. It was not, in fact, the military consensus, which probably sounds a little bit uh, contradictory because civilian control is supposed to place reins on the military, right? The military consensus I can describe and is repeated ad infinitum by reading you the view of Admiral Leahy, who was not code pink, right? He really deep in the and this was echoed by Eisenhower. But let me read it to you, and you can find countless other repetitions in this book. Yeah, this is it was Admiral William Leahy. He was a top he was a top naval guy. Okay, so this is what he writes. It is my opinion that the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no no material assistance in a war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. My own feeling was that in being the first to use it, we had adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. This is a military guy saying. I was not taught to make war in that fashion, and wars cannot be won by destroying women and children. That was the consensus military view that Truman ignored. This is a view that was echoed by Dwight Eisenhower, by the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey. No, Japan, and we knew this because we had we'd broken the purple code, the magic code, was ready to surrender so long as the emperor could have at least a titular role, wouldn't be subject to war crimes prosecution. The emperor was still viewed as a deity. And in fact, we needed the emperor because he was the one who was still revered. And if he said surrender, the military would comply. But Truman refused at Potsdam, despite overture of Secretary of War Henry Stimson, to water down his unconditional surrender standard that had been issued against Germany, the Nazis. Despite the fact that he was urged, listen, you know, you just got to let the emperor have a role. This can solve the whole problem immediately. We don't need the bombs. We don't know the details of the decision making because the final is made between Jimmy Burns, the Secretary of State, and Truman in secret. Yeah, they don't leave any fingerprints. Except here is where circumstantial evidence is more powerful than the direct evidence. What explains why, after the bombs, they are able to accept the emperor as a titular ruler of Japan, but they wouldn't do it before, because they wanted to drop the bombs. Now, what other circumstantial evidence comes into play is our somersault with regard to our eagerness to have Russia or the Soviet Union declare war in Japan. Prior to our Alan Gordo and knowing we had the bomb, we were all wanting Russia needed to get in there. We want you to get in there and make sure the Japanese troops in Manchuria can't back to, get back to the mainland. Harping, harping, harping on Stalin to get in to, because they had a non-aggression treaty with Japan at the time. Suddenly, after Alamogordo, oh, we tell, we, we, we want to do slow walk. No, you really don't want to declare war on them. Yo, know, you got to settle things with the Chinese and, and make sure that they're comfortable with your position in Manchuria. So we stopped. Why would we do that? Because we wanted, we didn't want the Japanese to surrender before we got the bomb. And we were worried that if, if the Soviet Union declared war fast, they would surrender and we couldn't drop the bombs. Now, what were we hoping to accomplish by dropping the bombs? Here again, the evidence is circumstantial because, you know, most, most of the time people don't 
write down and leave fingerprints when they're making a dastardly deal. But the clear circumstantial evidence is we thought Stalin was reneging on the Yalta Accords, and we were trying to kick him out of Bulgaria and Romania, Eastern and Central Europe, because he had his troops there. And this was thought to say, hey, we've got this super weapon. You need to get out. You need to hold fair, free and fair elections. Um, now, Stalin didn't flinch, so ne they have never held any. We also wanted to send a message to Stalin, hey, stay out of Manchuria. Don't go to Kuril Islands. You're going to have nothing to do with post-World War II Japan. Uh, and he, wasn't, he didn't flinch on that score either. So the diplomacy was a complete failure. It was intended to intimidate Stalin, but it didn't work anyway. But the, the point, however, is, and I think this is what's important in thinking about not only the bombs, but the context of how the United States runs its national security lines, is that this was a political decision opposed, it was not agreed to by any of the military people, and made by who? Two professional politicians. Harry Truman and Jim Burns' entire life was political. Their intellectual universe is limited to political calculations. That's all it's about. And Jimmy Burns was saying, you know, it's the Japs, you know, who cares? You know, they didn't say anything. Neither Truman nor Jimmy Burns blinked an eye when Roosevelt locked up 120,000 Japanese Americans in concentration camps because there was, quote, no evidence of espionage or sabotage, which, according to General DeWitt, was confirming indication they were ready to commit treason. That is, because they shared all the earmarks of innocence, they must be guilty. Right? I mean, this is it. You can't make this Abe stuff calls up. calls that the not yet guilty. Yeah, yeah. It's like the not yet guilty of Michael Hayden. you got to spot on the not yet guilty because they're not showing their hands that would enable you to spy on them legally. So they're really, really mischief makers. Okay? So we have these two politicians there making political calculations. They also said, Jimmy Burns saying, hey, you know, we spent $2 billion on ma making the Manhattan Project. You know, Congress is going to be angry. We wasted the money if we don't drop the bombs. And he says, and so what? No, no one will care. The Japanese, they won't care if we killed them. You know, they did Pearl Harbor, and no one cared when we locked up them at, in, 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 in the 10 concentration camps. The Supreme Court approved it. No one shrugged their shoulders and said, well, so what? So these guys are thinking, okay, we're not going to find any blowback. And they then make up after the fact. You know, this manufacture the story, oh, it was necessary. Because otherwise, it wasn't one, it's two million soldiers were getting done. Now, of course, how come the information doesn't come out immediately? Because all this stuff is classified. Aside from the fact that all of the classification is the handiwork only of the executive branch. The executive order created in classification is simply promulgated by the president. He doesn't rely on any statutory authority whatsoever. And Congress lets them get away with it. <laughs> oh, it's classified. So what? They even, they even let the executive branch classify congressional documents, like relating to Saudi Arabia, their own post-mortem on 9-11. But that's why this information doesn't come out. And that's why it's so important that we reward and give incentives to people like Gar, who are willing to go after that and say, wait, now, this is a huge cover-up. A huge cover-up. <coughs> And there was, it was obvious, and I think this is at page 449 in the book, where they were trying to make sure that McGeorge Bundy was kind of manufacturing um, uh, Henry Stimson's memoirs. Because remember, Henry Stimson's Secretary of War, who at least nominally was involved in deciding you know, the targeting of the bombs that ultimately landed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And they basically say, we can't let, you know, the same story that emerged after World War I, which was true, namely, we didn't need to get into the war. There were a handful of Americans who had died going into knowing war zones that the Nazis, I mean, the German submarines sunk because they were in violation of uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the neutrality obligations uh, of, of neutrals in wartime. Uh, and so we went in not to save democracy. We went to save the British and the, and the French empires. And after the war ended, their empires expanded enormously. We said, okay, wonderful. This is the war to save democracy. So, yeah, so this is, this is, yeah, this is, so 
four, four, four forty nine. Yeah, then this, and it's a wonderful book, and we uh, we can't do justice to it because. So. This is the cover. -up. Yeah, this is this is the cover up. This is in 1946. And did you say that? Uh, okay, so so uh, this letter is sent from Conant, who's the president of Harvard, who's on the interim committee that made the target of rubber stamp. Uh, Louder, Joe. He, he sent it. The, the, the Conant was on the uh, interim committee, which was set up by Truman and Burns to kind of cover to create. Um, the impression that it was um, a deliberative process when it was only the two guys the two making the whole decision. It was kind of a it was set up in order to endorse what they wanted to do. And we'll go through those decisions in a minute. So he, he writes as follows to Henry Bundy, but the, the, and I'll read it. It says, You may be inclined to dismiss all this talk as representing only a small minority of the population, which I think it does. That is, because there are initial rumblings against why you drop these atomic bombs. And they were they were not completely inaudible, but mostly, but they were small voices. However, this type of sentimentalism, you know, sentimentalism because people winced when they looked at the little kids who were incinerated by the atomic bombs. That's sentimentalism. And rather than that's how civilized people respond to the barbarians. Anyway, for I regard it as Bound that it is bound to have a great deal of influence on the next generation. The type of person who goes in to teaching, particularly school teaching, will be influenced a great deal by this type of argument. We are in danger of repeating the fallacy which occurred after World War I. You recall that it became accepted doctrine among a group of so-called intellectuals who taught in our schools and colleges that the United States had made a great error in entering World War I, and that the error was brought about largely by the interests of powerful groups the bankers and munition makers who had super profits at that time. You remember, our borrowing went from one, one billion to 30 billion. 30,000 fold increase during the war. Of course, there is little relation between these two types of fallacies, but I mentioned the history after World War I only to emphasize that a small minority if it represents the type of person who is both sentimental and verbally minded and in contact with our youth may result in a distortion of history. So. This letter says, oh, you're sentimental, you know, if you kind of shun war crimes. You know, if you're kind of shocked at the uh, gas chambers of Nazi Germany. Sentimental? That shows that you're a human being. And not a barbarian. And this is, and, and, and this is what's written uh, to try to shade how Stimson portrays the decision. And it, and it worked. And it misleads. Yeah. It and, and, and it worked. It worked. That's probably the most effective propaganda in American right. history. And, and, and because of the classification system, nobody can second guess these guys, right? So, no. And so that's why, and, and this is kind of the, the building blocks of Tom Brokaw's The Greatest Generation. These people all fought this wonderful war. You know, they played by Queensberry rules. Well, the other guys did tad dastardly things. And there we should be so, so admiring of the people who committed war crimes in Japan. Did he? And let me pause for a second here, and I don't want to get too legal. One definition, a clear definition of a war crime, is using a weapon in circumstances that you know is likely to cause massive numbers of civilian deaths that's vastly disproportionate to the military objective at issue. There wasn't any military objective at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Zero. It was a diplomatic approach to try to frighten Stalin in Manchuria and Eastern and Central Europe. It's a war crime by any definition. By any definition. So, it, it, so Bruce, it, it, we want to make clear that we're, we're uh, Gar's not here, and he would not be making that argument, okay? Um, the <clears throat> maybe a third of the law is direct evidence, and circumstantial evidence is uh, maybe two-thirds of criminal and civil law. So we're make, Bruce is making a circumstantial evidence argument, and uh, if Gar's not a, a Warrior. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. Not, Bruce, Bruce, very uncomfortable. With Everyone here can hear you fine, but the people online need, a, need the microphone. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Your microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. 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 Yeah. So, so I just we just want to make clear that we're not representing these as Gar's views. We're taking Gar's evidence, and, and we don't want to go in and read the Eisenhower and the bombing survey. Yeah. Well, I mean, they basically the Eisenhower and the bombing survey just repeat what Blade said. I mean, have right. they, no, 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 what did Eisenhower do? Do you have the Eisenhower quote? Yeah, um, read the Eisenhower I'll read the Eisenhower quote. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
amazingly strong. Yeah. So, Eisenhower writes, you know, after he's listening to Henry Stimson, you know, telling him that the dumb bomb is going to be used. He says, during his recitation of the relevant facts, this is Eisenhower speaking, and he's re referring to Stimson, I had been conscious of a feeling of depression, and so I voiced to him my grave misgivings, first on the basis of my belief that Japan was already defeated and that dropping the bomb was completely unnecessary, and secondly because I thought that our country should avoid shocking world opinion, mandatory as a measure, I mean, by the use of a weapon whose employment was, I thought, no longer mandatory as a measure to save American lives. It, is my belief, it was my belief that Japan was at the very moment seeking some way to surrender with a minimum loss of faith, and that was maintaining the emperor as a titular ruler in Japan. And, they, you know, and this is Eisenhower's so, the one D-Day. So both Burns and, and, and Truman were reading the magic uh, they broke the code on the Japanese, so w they knew that the emperor had intervened and wanted to end the war. Uh, they read all the ca uh, all these uh, <clears throat> uh, cable traffic between uh, Tokyo and Moscow, where they were trying to get the Russians to uh, intervene and stop the war. Then, so the emperor, you know, was, was there. They knew all that. Now, uh, uh, it's interesting now because this when we. Did this the, the uh, Oppenheimer movie? Has everybody here seen the Oppenheimer movie? Yeah, yeah. Well, the Oppenheimer movie is interesting because um, you know my my take on it is that basically he started out as uh, kind of a citizen of the republic, uh, did doing the, the, the baking the bomb. He did not know about the emperor wanting to end the war. He did not know that he, he did not have access to any of the secret information uh, cable codes that were broken. Uh, he did not know um, the details about um, the, uh, how important it was uh, to water down unconditionally, either to drop unconditional uh, surrender or water it down um, as it was done before that language struck out by Burns at Potsdam that, so that the emperor could basically stay in place. He did not know that. He didn't know um, he didn't know a lot of things. Um, and so when he learned these things later on, uh, I think it radicalized him. And, and he came out against the uh, hydrogen bomb, and they basically uh, set the, this committee up to, to, to do him in, which the movie does a good job of that. That was no due process. And he really was, uh, they had to basically take him out because, you know, they couldn't have the guy that invented the bomb the most prominent scientists coming out against using these bombs the, the, the next generation. So he really ended up being a subject uh, a subject in an empire, whereas he started out as a citizen of the Republic. And all this information that now guards Oppenheimer learned this stuff, um, a lot of it, um, and it started to turn it later on. And There's a footnote, John, that the this Energy is Department like recently it invalidated the decision to strip him of a security clearance because of <coughs> gross procedural irregularities that are euphemistic about, you know, like prosecutors discussing with the judges evidence that's not shown to the defendant. Anyway, I think the strongest argument that I can think of, you know, of, on in defense of what uh, Truman and Burns did is say, well, listen, we didn't actually, we didn't know for certain whether they would surrender if we modify unconditional surrender. You know, because anything can change, right? And he, <coughs> countries change their mind all the time. But there's clearly a way that they could have tested the authenticity and sincerity of the offer. Simply, you know, have somebody do uh, secretly meet with the emperor's agent, saying, this is what we're willing to do. You know, it can be all can all be concealed. It doesn't have to be in the public domain when you're testing out. This is not something that's novel in diplomacy. You know, when you secretly at least have feelers. And then, if they said no, they said, okay, well, we tried. We, ought, we offered them, you know, the emperor to stay and they still said no. But they didn't try, they didn't do that. Well, let's go through the uh, interim committee. So the interim committee was set up, yeah. right? And um, the, the issue was, do we just drop the 
uh, demonstration, you know, and show uh, without hitting any target, just show the power of this. It's a total game changer. And uh, uh, Burns totally shut that down. Well, uh, they, Marshall, I think, wanted to do that. Uh, Marshall later, when he saw which way, he, he didn't make the same statements. He wasn't as outspoken as, as Eisenhower and Lake were later. But, uh, he he uh, wanted the demonstration, is my recollection. And then the next one was in in, in Truman's claims. He, you know, in Truman goes all these things he said at the time in August, and then later in his memoirs and all these interviews, he continually says it was a military target. You know, now that the Hiroshima and Nagasaki right, were not right. military targets. Well. That, yeah, that basically what Bruce was saying earlier is when we say that Japan was defeated, what does that mean? Well, basically our Air Force and Navy uh, were about as effective as, the, as any, in, in, any area in American history. They basically uh, had, had gone through all the basic military targets uh, in, in Japan, and that's why uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, 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 had not already been bombed. Uh, and the Navy had hermetically sealed off um, after Okinawa. They, they based after uh, uh, the, um, the, Iwo Jima. Iwo, Iwo Jima. They basically had the place sealed off so that the uh, Japanese military um, in, in Manchuria could not get back onto the mainland. Yeah. And the so thing. that's what the military defeat meant. And, and then we have the quote that we put in the uh, invitation, the, the yeah. uh, McNamara, you might repeat that. Yeah, well, McNamara was the one who said, remember, this is Curtis LeMay, who was uh, chief of our Air Force, uh, the bombing raids in the Tokyo firebombing and whatever. And he, he, he reports, according to Rob McNamara, you know, we better win this war, because if we don't, we're going to be tried as war criminals. Right? And McNamara says, yeah, I agree. That's exactly what would have happened. We would have been tried as war criminals because we were no longer using weapons for military purposes. It was for diplomatic purposes, which, as I say, is the definition of a war crime. And to say, there's no way, in my judgment, that you can explain why we suddenly, after Alamogordo test, <coughs> no longer wanted Russia to get into the war. <laughs> Other than that, yeah, we knew we had them defeated. But we wanted to use the bombs for diplomatic purposes. Why would we suddenly want to discourage Russia from declaring war on Japan? Unless we had an ulterior motive. It all just works together. But I think also it's useful to examine, you know, in, in, in law we have something called prior similar acts. You know, if an institution or person is engaged in something that looks similar to what you hear, then it'd be an inference you can draw is the same same footprint that's you see again. And if you look at the history of the United States involvement in wars, it's over and over again, it's lies that come out of the executive branch, which began with the Mexican-American War, where James K. Pope, he lied, he said, oh, that the Mexican army had killed an American soldier on American soil. So Abe Lincoln, who's then a member of Congress, introduced what's called spot resolution, said, really? Show us the spot on American soil this time. Pope wouldn't respond. He just ignored it. And of course, Congress didn't force them to do anything either. They didn't, didn't yeah. investigate. Yeah, they didn't investigate nothing. The Congress didn't investigate, and, and Pope simply refused to respond to the, the spot resolutions. But you know, in, in the aftermath, yeah, everybody understood that Lincoln was correct. And in fact, the House of Representatives in 1848 passed a resolution saying that Pope is running an unconstitutional war based upon a lie. First time and only time that Congress you know, played that back up. But then we go forward, and, and, and then the Mexican-American War is just one instance. You know, the Spanish-American War, you know, it was fought, you know, we had to give self-determination to Cuba, Spain as a tyrant, and then we go into the Philippines, and what do we do? We tell Lizo, really, you know, the, the, the Philippines are a danger, we need to quash their effort at self-determination, we engage in torture, the hearings cover up all the torture and the killings. They were making war crimes, if you again. Anybody who's over 10 years old was automatically a suspect. In anticipation of the Phoenix program in Vietnam, really, it was really bad stuff. And then World War One, you know, Wilson lies about the Lusitania. It had weapons, it had ammunition that was going for the Canadians. And they said, "Oh, it was totally 
unwrong to sink this civilian ship. It wasn't a civilian ship. It was carrying contraband. Well, the German, the German government put ads in all the major papers saying, yeah. do not get on yeah, the don't, ship. Yeah, you shouldn't be traveling this zone. But even aside from that, if you're a, if you're a, a ship carrying <laughs> contraband, you're a, target of, a legitimate target to be attacked. And then we go through World War One, and FDR was lying about the USS Greer. We were already, before Pearl Harbor, attacking and assisting the British in attacking German submarines without any declaration of war. And, 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 and FDR just was lying about what, what our warships were doing. Again, there's no oversight, nothing like that. We get to the Korean War, and, and Harry Truman describes it as what? A police action. A police action? Three million Chinese soldiers were on the brink of nuclear war over the Yalu River. Tens of thousands of the U.S. <laughs> Americans die, millions of casualties. A police action? So, and then we go, yeah, we, we, the Vietnam, we know the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, there's no second torpedo weapons attack. Weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, Very so well. it's just over and over again. Yeah, the weapons of mass destruction, it's all stuff and cut off and was going to So your point something. is that Gore's book, it's nothing new under the sun. Yeah, it, it's not, it, 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 this is, you know, this isn't the first, you know, Gore's not, uh, this, this, this is consistent with a, over a hundred years of history. Where, yeah, where you, you don't have to strain credulity. The executive branch lies. Hiram Johnson, a senator from California, says truth is the first casualty of war. And he's right. As soon as war comes, the executive branch starts to lie. And it begins from the beginning. Now, some are more successful than others. I think the classification system makes the ability to lie with impunity uh, more dangerous because you don't have any sunshine even after the fact that discloses the lies. Uh, I mean, Harry Truman still today. He's viewed as, as, as John was saying, you know, people's families say, yeah, my dad's lived because of Harry Truman. Otherwise, he was sailing, he's going to have to invade Japan. And that still is the prominent narrative that's in our civics textbooks. A staggering law. Yeah, it goes back to the, uh, so Harvey Bundy, so Conan wrote that letter that read, uh, Bruce read, the, uh, George Bundy's father. And then he got young McGeorge. But McGeorge Bundy was very nice to me when I was an undergraduate in college. Uh, but he, you know, he does not look good in this. He, he does not look good in this uh, yeah. book because he they he go and he writes um, uh, memoirs, uh, Stimson's memoirs, and they get this Harper's article and they lay down this this um, propaganda that basically that all their lives would have been lost. Yeah, and part of part of the thinking was. Well, if we tell the truth, you know, it'll undermine our ability to be the good guys against the bad guys, the communists. So this was kind of the height of the Cold War. Oh, you just can't say anything bad about the United States. Because um, otherwise you're unpatriotic, and that's why, you know, you have the McCarthy hearings and the Hollywood 10 and a If you do anything suggesting the United States is other than angelic, we're so benevolent everywhere we go, you know, we really... And, and we were able to train you know, the nuclear bombs not to be quite as vicious as otherwise. I mean, that's, that's the hysteria that comes, the distortions of the facts. And that's where the, the, the cover-up began. No, you can't touch this stuff. And that's why, you know, Oppenheimer can get railroaded. Shrug shoulders, it doesn't matter. I mean, even as a non-lawyer would know, prosecutors don't get to talk to the judge that's deciding the case. And that's kind of a little fundamental, you know? And this is, it goes on with impunity, no one says anything, no one resigns, and it, it takes 60 years later for the rectification. And that's why we're trying, Garo is really, really important, but we need to remember that the pathology that he exposed is much deeper than is the pathology that it's not, is in. It's not isolated. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's built in to this psychology of empire. Lie, cheat, steal, it doesn't matter anything to dominate the world. And, 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 and say, that's why you know, Tom Brokaw, the greatest generation, it was, well, this is, we have such admiration, they didn't do anything wrong. You know? so yeah, they played by Queensberry rules in World War II. It obviously is nonsense. Though. War, by definition, I say, is the legalization of first degree murder. In wartime, you get to kill people, which in peacetime would sentence you to prison for life or a death penalty. So, that's not a, pleasant thing to contemplate. Sometimes you have to do it in self-defense, 
but war is not pleasant. But you know all of this stuff about uh, how, how great our, our, our military is. Military is a tragedy that sometimes is necessary. I don't not a pacifist, but exalting. I say I, I put well, it. We exalt the armored knight, and the thinker gets put in the closet. <laughs> well, this is a, a it's an interesting situation because you know civilian control of military is you know the basic concept, right? It's, uh, and and this. It's not a, a, where that broke down. This is where it worked. Uh, it worked. Uh, that's not the problem here. We, we, the military did not really make this decision. These two politicians did. These two former senators. Uh, um, but, where, where, but I think if you and, look at the civilian, so they, if you look at the civilian justification right. that Madison was given, he was in the context of believing that we actually would have separation of powers, because in the context of civilian. Predominance. He's saying, but you can never let the president get their hands on the military because we know exactly what he's going to do. He's going to inflate danger and take us to war for nothing. Right. That, that's a, those are the precise examples that he right. gives. And so what we have is when we have total breakdown, which we've done, with separation of powers, then civilian control doesn't diminish wars. In some sense, it, it aggravates the problem. You know, and LBJ is another example. LBJ's decisions, as you well know, John, on Vietnam, they're 100% political. I remember Captain Adler would lose a war on my watch. You know, we have the tapes. He's talking to Richard Russell. No way, because he remembers. Everybody says to Truman, who lost China? Okay, I can't have that to me. And he's saying that. Why? Because it's politically dangerous to him. That's why he's doing this stuff. He, he's not making military decisions, oh, this is likely to succeed or not. Yeah, we can go into great detail into how McNamara managed the Vietnam War. The only way McNamara, in terms of civilian control of military, where it worked. But um, so when Jimmy Burns said that uh, Pakistan was a successful failure, what did he, what did he mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a Delphic one. I. It's hard to imagine. I think successful failure. I mean, I, I suppose it was successful at least in the sense that they were trying to urge. You know, Stalin, hey, really don't go in to Japan so fast. And I think at that time, the, the, the belief was that the super weapon was going to intimidate Stalin. We could kick him out of Central and Eastern Europe, and maybe intimidate him to stay out of Manchuria as well. But it didn't work out the way they thought. Uh, but they made the effort, is what they did. So it's a success in the sense that they utilized, they tried to utilize the Al Gordo test diplomatically to to uh, push Stalin, but it was a failure because Stalin didn't blink and we didn't do anything. We took it, our, it didn't work. Yeah, it didn't work. But I think Gar, uh, Gar makes uh, uh, makes a very uh, strong case for how Truman, uh, the evidence shows that Truman delayed Potsdam for over a month and both Stalin and um, Ward Churchill were very eager to get together and um, he put it off on the basis of wanting to know whether this weapon was going to, whether the test results. So the, the, the testing schedule was was forced. It, it reminded me of almost like Elon Musk, uh, now I'm reading uh, uh, Eisen biography. He sets these arbitrary deadlines and then drives everybody crazy to meet them. Um, but they, they set that deadline down. They were going to push off Potsdam from mid-June to mid-July. Uh, and, and then we'll know that result. And so when they were on the ship going over to Potsdam, they got the word, the code, that it had been a very successful test. And then suddenly he transforms, and, and uh, the language, there's a lot of language in these uh, documents that have come out. Um, uh, I think it's Stimson talked about holding, uh, holding a royal straight flush. Uh, and uh, poker analogies uh, that we would have more cards later on, uh, meaning if we push Potsdam back, uh, that we'll have an ace in, so-called ace in the hole. So it was clear that uh, when he got, when Truman got there, uh, he, he was basically transformed, right? And he, he, he basically, the whole thing was to, then not to, to, not to keep, I think that's part of what Burns said was uh, Potsdam's successful failure is that they basically did not want Stalin to come in 
because he had agreed to come in three months after the beat the uh, not the German treaty. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and um, <clears throat> so they wanted to keep Russia um, from getting into the into into the uh, Asian arena. So they basically turned pretty much turned on a dime. Didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we went yeah. from hammering in, we got to get in there as fast as you can, right. you know, and so, hey. Because that was the reason for going to Potsdam, was to get that commitment that the Japanese would fold once they knew Russia was coming in. And, so. and that's what the magic uh, deciphering showed, that the Japanese felt that the Russians, Soviets declared war at the end. Uh, so we knew that if the Soviet came in, that maybe Japan would surrender before we could drop the atomic bomb, which is what we didn't want to have happen. I think there was a vast overestimation that the atomic bombs really changed the entire nature of international relations in the world, um, not recognizing that, wait a minute, you know, you can't keep this scientific information secret. You know, they, they're going to, I mean, the Soviets, I think, in 48, 49, already had their own weapon. Um, and that the whole history of the world in war is, yeah, every generation escalates their ability to develop a weapon with greater proficiency in killing other human beings. That's, <laughs> that's an evolution that's continued from day one. And no, this is not the end game. Or there'd be weapons that'll kill more people. You know, now they're probably cyber weapons we don't even know about. They're secrets that maybe can kill more people. And I don't know, biological, chemical weapons, you know, we could... Yeah, I'm sure kill as many, not more, than the nuclear weapons. You know, with the same speed, maybe even faster speed. Uh, and the fact is that if you look at, well, what did the atomic bombs do with regard to affecting, you know, post-World War II situation, and even the ending of World War II? It, it didn't seem to have any impact on anything. We still ended up in the Cold War, the Soviet Union. They got it three, yeah, years, we, they, three they got, years later. They got three years later. Yeah. And so... What are they, this idea that this changed all the balance of forces in the world was nonsense. It didn't prove that way at all. You know, we had standoff, mutual assured destruction. Well, it, we didn't, we didn't it, it changed the way we behave. In well, other words, there was more of a multipolar, um, think of it in terms of the animal world. You know, if you go to Africa, you know, you've got really big animals like lion, you know, lions and Top of the food chain, the elephants, um, crocodiles, hippos, big animals. And so the big animals here were the Russians and, and the British and us. And so when we got that uh, atomic bomb, when they got that news, suddenly we we became uh, not, not not really equals with with Russia and England. Uh, it, we well, really for, came. It really well for the psychology period. changed, even though it didn't work. It explains his behavior. His behavior changed. Well, I don't. I, mean, I, I don't think Stalin changed his behavior. No, no, at all. no. Truman's behavior. Or something. Well, but even even Truman it's, afterwards, it because once the Soviets, when he Truman stopped after after Stalin refused to flinch. Right. Truman didn't try to take over Europe or even Bulgaria or Romania or anything. He just said, okay. He took the troops home and said, oh, you failed. And then, of course, uh, he continued. He won the election in 1948 and whatever. But. The fact is that it didn't give us an edge over the Soviet Union. We ended up in a stalemate, basically, until the Soviet Union kind of dissolved in 1991 on its own, well, because we attacked them and all, because um, of right. huge inefficiencies in the, you know, in the planned economy. Um, but I don't think the... And, and you could go back, even at the time of de Tocqueville, writing in 1840s, he says, ah, he's spying in the future, he says, hey, the two dominant part the nations in the world are going to be the United States and Russia, because they got the population and the economic strength. He's writing in 1840. And so, and that's what happened after World War II. And both sides had the atomic bomb, so it ended up being, right. it just, it it just it canceled each other out. And so we didn't, we didn't, we didn't have, have any ability, you know, despite the weapons, to push Russia backward, the Soviet Union back, despite we tried to do it with covert operations, they all were right. spectacular failures. And the Soviet Union didn't push us back either. We had NATO. It was kind of a standoff, but like it always is, you know. I mean, so all it is is we wasted more money, more so, people died. So, Bruce, but can you think of a, uh, can you think of a book more uh, seminal in terms of, you know, 
single book in American history uh, has had, uh, I mean, it's, it's just gripping, this book. Yeah, this, I mean, I think yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, it's the greatest analogy in my judgment, John, is the Pentagon Papers, in the sense that there's more reason disclosing the lie after lie after right. lie in the cover-up to, uh, you know, to justify the war. Uh, you know, the lies were a little bit different, uh, but this one is, this was significant because, you know, it, 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 it got the class, it waited till the classified information was declassified, and then was not reluctant to expose and attack, you know, the military industrial complexes cover-up for so long. Uh, with this huge myth. It's still, I mean, Americans, I say today, the kids who go through college and high school and graduate school and that get trained at Georgetown, they still believe the atomic bomb saved two million American life, without a doubt. And then we were benevolent, and hey, we did all these great things, we didn't commit war crimes. And oh yeah, we had the war crimes tribunal for the Far East, to put Tojo and everybody else on trial. But our people weren't. It goes back to Curtis LeMay. If we lost the war, we'd been uh, as war criminals. He knew it. So, Bruce, we got a question in the back. Why don't we uh, start to open it up? I have a friend who used to be the media. Give me the phone. Give me the phone. Give me the phone. But um, uh, he, was a, he was the public relations or media director, something like that, for the Udvarhazi. Air and Space Museum, where the Enola Gay is, the plane that dropped the atomic bomb. Yeah. And um, he was called into the director's office uh, one day, and the director said, we've got some Japanese dignitaries coming uh, to take a look at the museum this afternoon, and do not, I repeat, <laughs> you know, do not show them the Enola Gay, which is, of course, <laughs> the first thing I want to see. And uh, this one uh, Japanese gentleman says to this guy, Thank you for dropping the atomic bomb. And, and the, this guy, a friend of mine, thought he was being facetious. He said, well, you know, I mean, it was a war and these things happened. And the, the Japanese guy says, no, I'm serious. I mean it. Thank you for dropping the atomic bomb. Because if that hadn't happened, the warlords running the country would have continued the war for years. Japan would have been destroyed. Japanese culture would have been destroyed along with it. Millions of people would have died. Millions of Japanese, millions of Americans. Therefore... <laughs> You know, thank you for dropping an atomic bomb. The guy goes, well, uh, you know, you're welcome. I mean, any, anytime. Uh, but uh, so there, uh, whether that is a, a, a widely held uh, theory in uh, in Japan or belief in Japan, I don't know. But uh, an interesting sort of other point of view. Yes, I mean, listen, I don't want to to um, to discredit you know that idea out of hand, but I think the response is, well, how do you know? that if we, in fact, secretly said, we'll accept your surrender and the Hirohito remains, that they wouldn't have accepted. We didn't even try. We didn't want to try. We were fearful that they might say yes. The same reason why we didn't want Russia to get in and get Japan's surrender after, after the Soviet Union declared war. So this is, they don't understand, it, it, because I, I understand that everything in international diplomacy has an element of uncertainty to it. You know, until you got an agreement, you don't have an agreement. So, I mean, Japan hadn't said, okay, we're signing on the dotted line, we're surrendering, they can change their mind. But at least we ought to test it based upon the magic uh, information that we're getting. Right. And, and, and because there's no downside to us. It doesn't have to be in the public domain. We just test it out. If they say no, okay, then we know that that was a phony overture. <laughs> I don't think it would have been a phony overture, but that shows the insincerity of the administration and Truman, they didn't want Japan to surrender before we dropped the bombs. Um, Bruce, I, I think at all this most troubling and, and uh, maybe sad part is that um, there was a, a midway point. We, we could have dropped a bomb 20 miles you know, west of Tokyo, right? Uh, and brought all of our allies, <laughs> including the Russians, to see it. Um, and you know, if you want to make sure that, oh, well, we just don't produce one of these a year, we could have dropped uh, another one, you know, uh, a few days later and invite all of our allies to see it. Obviously, the Japanese in Tokyo would see it quite clearly and, and then see what happens. So I, it also, that's the more troubling part of it in a sense is I, I could have easily dealt with the military side and say, guys, I, I agree, the military was not supportive, but 
why don't we just do a, a, a show me test? And not drop it on people, but drop it enough so that people would see, my God, you, you've got a real revolution here in, in terms of, uh, of killing power. Yeah. Well, that, that was that was what uh, George Marshall um, Right. Marshall, Marshall felt that way. I think a lot of them did. But it, 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 Burns was, uh, was the, Harry Truman's personal representative on that interim committee, and he ramrodded that through. Yeah. And no. Right. Why not? No. Huh? Why? Yeah. Why not? Uh, but I think because you still had a major military point. One of the oh, no, no, the, argue, yeah, the argument was we only had two bombs. Yeah. Right. Okay. And uh, it may not work. Yeah. May go on, and then you have everybody oh. looking at this demonstration and the things it does, and it doesn't work. Oh that, well, that, sure. That, so let's wipe out a hundred thousand people. I mean, you've got a second bomb. No, no, no. But that was the argument that prevailed in the interim committee. Is that that was Burns' argument. I mean, you have to remember also that, that the bombings come after the Tokyo fire bombings, which killed more than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So we didn't have any scruples about the number of deaths. So what? You know, we already did it. So the Curtis LeMay was already guilty of his own standards of war crime. So who cares a couple hundred thousand more died? Right. And, and they preserved, actually, as you mentioned, I think Nagasaki and Hiroshima were not firebombed, partly to leave them open for a nuclear bomb test. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it still says a lot, the fact that we didn't... No, I, I, we didn't say that. I don't think I don't think Evan said it. It's that they had um, not, the, the arguments for that Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima did not have that many military assets, okay? So they had gone through, you know, it's, it's kind of like Rumsfeld saying, you know, we got to get out of Afghanistan and go to war in uh, uh, Iraq because there are more targets. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, Japan was kind of like Afghanistan. All the targets were gone. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't as if there weren't any military in those areas. There yeah. just were not very many. And then the other argument was uh, that if uh, that if we announced. What was it that they would get the uh, POWs, our POWs, yes. and they put them in, in the testing area? Yeah, yeah, they would go and put our our POWs there. That was another argument. Uh, so there are all these arguments. It looks bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that it just yeah. looks bad that we didn't try it somewhere where right. there wasn't a population, because that would have demonstrated military power. For sure. Right, but the records of the interim committee don't. Get into the the magic and the code breaking and the emperor's intervention and all that. No, no. Yeah. It's, it's a, but it goes back. We did not want the Japanese to surrender before we could demonstrate everything. Yeah. Demonstrate on population. Yeah. Demonstrate. Show demonstrate on population. Right. And Contrary to what Truman said, yeah. Truman consistently said. These were military targets. He maintained that in spite of the evidence. It's in his memoirs, all his public statements, all the way through. Yeah. So, so my question is, so they, they dropped two because to make sure that if one didn't work, the other did? Well, once the one worked, you know it works. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that's the, why, only, why would they drop two? They only had two. Because they they had, so if they had three, they would drop three. Yeah, yeah right. So they a billion dollars on each the plutonium and the uranium bombs. And so yeah. they had to test both of them. Because well, <laughs> I was going to ask why they picked Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Uh, they had four cities, and Hiroshima just turned out to be the best wow. division target. And they dropped a second one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but uh, they dropped a the second one. Well, I mean, they didn't. After the first bombing, there wasn't an immediate. You know, we had to we, 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 we right. didn't accept surrender, so we dropped right. another one exactly. because yeah. they hadn't surrendered yet. You know? Right. And we didn't. And at that point, we hadn't agreed that the that the uh, temper was going to be able right. to remain the stitch of our head. Now, after the second bomb, then they did. We did make that overture, yes. and then within three or four days, it's they said, "Okay, we're done." Yeah. yeah. Well, MacArthur didn't want a little, an uprising, you know. Well, I mean, you know, we have guys there. And he doesn't want an uprising in Japan, and boy, throw out the emperor, he knew it was going to cost. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Right. The yeah, emperor's well, the only one who get the Japanese to yeah, surrender. You get yes. the Japanese army to, you know, get all riled up if you fire the emperor. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, a couple of sides, and then my main point. Uh, is, does Alperovitz, is that his name? Yeah. Alperovitz? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
okay. uh, uh, mentioned that the targeters for the second bomb knew that Nagasaki was the center of Christianity yes. in Japan. And secondly, uh, does he mention that Truman, when he was vice president, did not know we were making the bomb? Yeah, I think he understands that Truman was totally shielded from well, that, uh, as he didn't know about the man. As someone with a, a reputation for conspiracy theories, I love that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had 100,000 people involved in the Manhattan Project, and yet they were able to keep that a secret, for, even from the, the vice president of the United States. <laughs> No, but, but, but most, I mean, there are only a handful in Congress who knew about the money. They were voting the appropriations in secret, you know, classified budgets. Sam Rayburn and a handful knew what the money was going for, because when the money started to get into the very high numbers, they knew they couldn't conceal this forever. I don't know, I don't recall uh, Gar saying anything about Nagasaki being the center of Christianity. <laughs> it is. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Or, but some were Christian. They didn't Christian uh, care, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they knew. Uh, uh, a little off target, uh, could the firebombing of Dresden be seen as a political, it didn't have any military purpose, its only uh, purpose was to delay the Soviet advance on, on Berlin, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and finally, I would support what this gentleman heard from the Japanese, uh, with, the, we had firebombed 67 cities before, uh, including Tokyo, as you point out, uh, and uh, we, we, if we firebombed another 30 or 40, it seems like the Japanese would have surrendered. Uh, and by uh, dropping the, the bombs, to their dramatic effect, reduced the number of Japanese that were killed. No, but I, I just, I want to repeat. What explains the refusal of the United States to approach secretly the Japanese and say, will you surrender as long as the emperor can have a titular role? We never did that no. until after we dropped the bombs. Now, if, if they said, no, we're not going to surrender anyway, even the November 8th, then okay. Then that has a strong case that, okay, we needed the bombs in order to get them to surrender. But we didn't well, do that. Well, I'm arguing that another 30, 40 cities firebomb probably would have accomplished the same objective. Yeah, of getting them to surrender. Well, they were 30, 40 cities. There were, there were four left that they were firebombing. They were military. They were militarily defeated. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. so the question was how to bring it to a close. Right. We yeah, probably exactly. would not have had well, to it. Well, the other, the other, the other, might have delayed it for six months. <laughs> the, the <laughs> other, cost any American lives. The other poli the political element here was we spent two billion dollars and Jimmy Burns hit. So we're going to say we we spent all this money at Al and didn't even use the bombs. Yeah. So that's. And, and, and say that's why they're thinking politically. Yeah. How are we going to do this? We got to explain to these people who voting all this money, he didn't even use them. Yeah, the Christianity thing I never I've never heard that before. I uh, Robert Beverly Tucker was uh, Virginian, and I when I went first time one of the first five trips to Japan, I um, met with him, and and he was a singular. He was saying, you know, we really struck out here. Uh, you know, the, the Japanese are not. Um, very porous culture in terms of Christianity, you know, whereas the Korean, I have an ancestor on my mom's side, and they went and started a, a, a <clears throat> they were very successful, Presbyterians, in getting uh, the Koreans to be Christians. But, so, I, I don't think any, um, <laughs> that there's any large number of Christians in, in uh, I would be very surprised with that. Enough, enough that the Japanese banned them. Banned them? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, never, no, that's exactly. fascinating. I never, I never heard that. Yeah. Well, they certainly, it, it certainly, uh, Christianity is not, what, you know, it was not oh, very yeah. successful in Japan. <laughs> oh, yeah. Whereas in Korea, amazingly, yeah, it was. Yeah, so, yeah. just the opposite. Which makes the bombing of the sole place in Japan where there are Christians. Bombing of that uh, even more bizarre. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, to me, it, I don't see the connection. But um, okay, so uh, where are we? We had you had a question over here, right? Uh, my name is Sandho Tree. Um, I from 1989 to 95, I was Gar Alprovitz's research director for the book. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, it's the best six years of my life. Um, you should have been up. I'm sorry he couldn't be here himself. Uh, I really wanted to see him after so many years. But 
Uh, there are two things um, that might be of interest, particularly since this is being held at the Republican Club, and I'm not a Republican, but uh, you'll, you'll be pleased to hear this. The, the two things that really surprised me in the research for this book was that, one, it, the, for the first 15 to 20 years after the bomb was dropped, many of the most vocal critics of the bomb decision were conservatives, not liberals. Liberals were still adamant that the emperor should have been hung as a war criminal. It was a symbol of fascism and, and had to be eliminated. Uh, many conservatives were the ones who spoke out, but for very different reasons, not necessarily for humanitarian ones. They believed that um, Japan needed to be a counterweight to the Soviets in the post-war world. It was not wise to keep bombing them and, and building up resentment in the post-war period. So they wanted to cut a deal earlier uh, and negotiate unconditional surrender, basically, and letting them know they keep the emperor. And, the, uh, uh, and so uh, by the 1950s, early 50s, the conservatives were arguing that bomb was unnecessary, that Truman knew it wasn't necessary, and that and this is the far right, not, not mainstream conservatives. But by the, uh, the Korean War, 1950, you have magazines like the Freeman, Harry Elmer Barnes, who I don't agree with, he was a you know, conservative historian, but later became a Holocaust revisionist, uh, argued that the bomb wasn't necessary, Truman knew it, etc., etc. And the way they explained it, however, they didn't have access to the documents. So they came up with conspiracy theories, much like today's environment. And they thought, oh, well, the reason they dropped the bomb was that uh, Truman wanted the Soviets to come in, the Democrats, the, particularly in the State Department. There were communists in the State Department, according to McCarthy, uh, that wanted uh, the Reds to take over Manchuria. That's why we lost China. That's why our boys are dying today in Korea. So that was their argument back then. By the early 60s, particularly by the time the Vietnam War heats up, and Gar's first uh, book, Atomic Diplomacy, is published in 65, that was his PhD dissertation from Cambridge, uh, the polarity of that argument flips. And the liberals now became anti-war because of the Vietnam War, and also uh, caught on to the, to, to the so-called revisionist history of the atomic bomb. And then the conservatives kind of flipped backwards and said, no, this is anti-American. You're, you're part of the anti-war left. Uh, so you see that weird flip. Um, it's not a total, uh, uh, you know, not, not uniform all around. John Hersey was a good example in 1946 with the, the New Yorker article, which is why they published the, the Harper's article to 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 re to counteract that history. Uh, the other interesting conservative thing was that um, Herbert Hoover well, turns out to be one of my heroes in this. Uh, Hoover, on August 6, 1945, wrote in his diary that the bomb revolted him to his soul because he knew it wasn't necessary. Even though he'd been out of office and was shunned by, ostracized by the Roosevelt administration, he still had many connections in the War Department. He served as Secretary uh, of uh, uh, Commerce and, and, and State uh, in previous years, so he knew lots of people, and they were telling him things that were going on in terms of negotiations. He understood a lot of the intelligence stuff, and so he was finally invited back to the White House in May of 1945, uh, or spring of 45, to meet with Truman. Uh, and in that meeting, he tells Truman, you know, a very wise advice. He knew the Soviets very well because he did the, the relief during the 1920s. He saved starvation. millions of Soviets from starvation. Yeah. Um, and he said, you have to understand the Soviets are very, very paranoid, Stalin especially. And the thing you must never, ever, ever, ever do is rearm Germany. Because they, they, more than anything else, are paranoid about that. Two world wars. Uh, and, and the plan before the atom bomb uh, proved uh, to, be, to be workable was basically the Morgenthau plan, that Germany would be remain a pastoral nation, never to reindustrialize. It, it would take four power cooperation to occupy Germany and to sit on them for decades, for generations. Once he gets the bomb, he doesn't have to do that anymore. We can now control Germany with one bomb. And so they brought Germany into NATO, they rearmed Germany, and what, what, what Hoover warned against was never saber, saber rattle against the Soviets, because they will clamp down they will turn inwards, they will arm tremendously, uh, and the way to deal with the Soviets is to show them what an open society looks like and how we function. And eventually they will collapse under their own contradictions. And basically Hoover described the Cold War before the Cold War actually happened, before there was a term for it. So th th those were very prescient remarks by, from, from, from Hoover. Well, that's a, that's a interesting. Yeah. 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 We're going to draw you into this morning. Yeah. Uh, just, just a footnote of history, also not anything close as interesting as what you just said. 
But I was an undergraduate at Berkeley in the in the mid in the early '60s, and Edward Teller was a professor there, and I met with him in his home and discussed this topic. He he knew nothing about uh, the potential uh, resignation or the you know cease ending the surrender the surrender of Japan, but he was adamantly against dropping the bomb. And he, he, he favored the plan of dropping it offshore where it could be seen and establish the credibility of this power, etc. But he was very much against dropping it on people. I'll tell you something, you know, what you just said about uh, collapsing under its own ridiculousness. I, I, I used to work for the uh, LA Times and The Economist, and, and spent about seven years, all told, living in my house. Still good. My, my, my wife is Russian. We go back there all the time. But um, in early January of 91, now the Soviet Union collapsed in August, and it was finally out of the picture in, in December. But in early January, late December, something like that, uh, a McDonald's, a Baskin and Robbins, and a, a Pizza Hut opened all, at right as, like two blocks from one another. And uh, I couldn't believe it. The lines to get into the McDonald's were like about four or five blocks long. As a matter of fact, when the Soviet Union was collapsing, like two blocks down the street where the Doma is located, there were still lines. I walked up there to get a cup of coffee or see what, see what it looked like. And there were still lines, seven blocks, the country's falling apart at the seams, and people are still lined up for big Bolshoi Max, you know, at, at, uh, at McDonald's. But, um, as the crowds started to dissipate a little bit, as the as the, the coup attempt was um, was in progress, the military's moving in. There was a coup, and then there was a counter coup. So the counter coup is the military takeover of, of, of the of the country again, and, and to be run under communists. And there were tanks all around the Duma where the holdout Democrats were, and uh, and and the people started to get hungry. It, it stays a little lighter at, in late August in Moscow. Than it, uh, than it does here, but it was about 10 o'clock, still kind of light, getting kind of twilight, and you can see people, it was like Woodstock in a way, there were hippies and old people, and people started drifting away to go get something to eat, and suddenly, an unmarked, you know, these Nevas, these, these sort of van, little vans, this Neva pulls up, no markings on it or anything, and starts handing out pepperoni pizzas. And people start flying, you know, people, I guess, were calling their friends or who knows what was going on. And suddenly the crowds come back and fast food, uh, just, and the crowds are what, what, what sort of encouraged the, the guys in the tanks from Tajikistan and all to get out and get some pizza. It was like a rock and roll movie where the whole town starts dancing or something like that. It was very strange, but fast food, uh, you know, destroyed communism. <laughs> well, I think, I think what the observation, um, uh, omits or incomplete is that the reason why you know this um, uh, didn't develop into a more amicable relations with Russia is because we kept expanding NATO and made it clear to them we wanted pension movement and ultimately we're going to control their political destiny. I mean, there's not a shadow of a doubt we want to overthrow Putin and. It's natural for a country when they feel they're being shoved around, you know, to then unify. The same reason why Cuba is still where it is today. It's because even though the Cubans didn't like all the things that Castro was doing, why they flee in large numbers. But when the United States made it clear, we want to run your country, we're in Guantanamo Bay, we want to overthrow you in the Bay of Pigs, Cuban Missile Crisis. That's the only reason why they're there today. And it's because we continue to suggest we want to run your country and they're going to resent it. Simple as that. That's our stupidity, really. Because the craving for power is so great. So great. It overrides common sense and say we can get along, we don't need this power. They want to exercise it just for the sake of exercise. So what? Uh, so can you tell us a little more about how you got involved in with Gar and your background? Sure. Um, I uh, went to Hampshire College in uh, in the 19, early 80s, and my very first semester, the first book, first class was on the American century, 
the first reading assignment was Atomic Diplomacy by Gara Perovitz. Oh, cool. And uh, about six years, seven years later, I took a class at the Institute for Policy Studies, an evening class for fun, on political <laughs> economy. Gara is actually more of a political economist than a historian these days. Um, and so I started working for him doing research on domestic political economy issues. And about six months into that, he said, well, you know, uh, the BBC is going to do a documentary updating my, my dissertation, my thesis, and uh, we, we, we need some more research done. And so the original idea was that I would spend maybe up to two years in the archives uh, looking for new documents. And we found so many documents that it lasted six years. Um, so we finally got the book out in time for the 50th anniversary of the atomic bomb dropping. Um, but that's how I got to end up working for Gar. Very interested in trying to find Jim Burns, any, any documents yes. from him, right? Yes, yes. And also all of the, uh, the other thing we were, we were looking for uh, very intently was the, uh, in, the high-level intelligence documents, which are gone. Um, the things that included ultra, so anything involving code breaking, the NSA took out of the archives back in the 70s before it was declassified. And so most American histories of World War II don't involve any of the intelligence stuff. We've broken not just the German, Japanese, and Italian codes, but it turns out we broke all the Allied codes, except for the British and, and Soviets. We didn't admit to those. <coughs> but everyone else, the Swiss, the Swedes, the Brazilians, the Saudis, everybody, the Chinese, we were reading all the codes. And uh, our history books have never been updated. So most of our uh, World War II histories still rely on the old narratives, whereas the Brits have done much more with their, their ultra intelligence and, and updating their, their history books. Uh, so this is a big, big chunk of it is missing because of... of, of uh, so how, how important do you think the magic, breaking the magic code was? Magic was incredibly in, uh, important. Magic was the diplomatic codes. Uh, and then there were also the Navy codes and the Army codes, the Japan that were broken uh, throughout the war. By the end of the war, it was so accurate that our intelligence had a better assessment, better inventory of what the Japanese Navy still had afloat than the Japanese Navy had. That when the peace fields were happening in Moscow in the spring of 1940, spring and summer of 45, our code breakers in the United States had built a replica code machine of the purple machine, sight unseen, using only dots and dashes for Morse code, international Morse code, intercepting those radio signals, and then using paper and pencil, basically, figuring out what those meant in a language most of these people didn't speak, uh, and, and then translating that. And so even before Pearl Harbor, we had that intelligence, but so few people uh, to, 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 to staff it. By the end of the war, this became a huge operation, it became the NSA later, uh, and the US was able to decrypt Japanese peace feelers between uh, their ambassador in Moscow and, and their home office in Tokyo faster than the home office in Tokyo could decrypt their own messages. <laughs> That's how important this was. And by the end of the war, the U.S. was able to intercept all, basically all Japanese shipping between uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the mainland. So Hiroshima is, is viewed as a military target because it, earlier in the war, it was a major port of embarkation. By the end of the war, the U.S. knew uh, where the Japanese ships were and, and it knew exactly where to intercept them with our submarines. And so the, the, the mining operations by the B-29s and by the submarines had sewn up the harbor uh, of Hiroshima so that nothing could really get in or out. It was a useless as a military port. It was not a military target at that point. So, so uh, yeah, in, uh, this, I've read a couple of biographies on Marshall now. And Mar Marshall went to uh, uh, the Republican candidate, uh, uh, Dewey. Dewey, right? Yeah. And, 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 and he was going to, because of the Pearl Harbor thing, he wanted to get into that, and, and, and that's where, and, and he went on, Truman didn't know about it, he went on his own and got, got him not to um, inject that into the election. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, nobody ever talks about this, but what if, this is a what if scenario, what if Henry Wallace had not been dropped from the ticket in 1944, and there was no Harry Truman, and Roosevelt dies in April of 45, and Henry Wallace becomes president? And, and Henry Wallace becomes president of the United States. Imagine. Yeah, yeah. Just imagine. That's the thesis of Peter Kuznick and Oliver Stone's book. Is that um, right? Yeah. And the 10 yeah. book documentary on Showtime. They talk oh, extensively. That's, no kidding. Yeah, excessively. About but I, I think on this issue, I don't. I don't think, the, as much as I'm admire of Henry Walsh, is that 
think probably the only um, vice presidential candidate or president ever created a Fortune 500 company. So that's my kind of comments. Uh, <laughs> but but, uh, oh, he's but Henry, I, on this, this, on, this, on, this on this on this on this decision, I don't think the reason. record shows that Henry Wallace would have. Um, do you do you know where he stood on this? Uh, no. He was, yeah. a, he was generally very progressive on these issues and probably would have been opposed to the bomb, but uh, we don't know. Yeah, I don't. Well, he well I think, I think the question is a, is a wonderful question for this reason, among others, is that it focuses attention on institutions as opposed to personalities. Mm -hmm. right. At the time of World War II, we were an empire. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter the personality, I mean, I mean it, it, only the very, very minor respects. It, it, that's why you go from Trump to Obama to, to Biden and the military industrial complex. We're still fighting the same wars. Nothing ever changes abroad. We've got 800 military bases and we go wherever we want. It doesn't matter who's in there because the institutional forces of this idea that we are chosen people and we need to be everywhere and we've got to give a reason to spend a trillion and a half bucks every year on the military industrial complex forces the decision. And it does, the personality becomes irrelevant. And we can guarantee well, whether Biden wins in 24 or not, we're going to have the same stupid foreign policy that continues, whether we're in Ukraine or fight China or whatever. Yeah. And, and, and Bruce, yeah. let's face it, the military, as you kind of point out in Gar's book, was not all that supportive of this decision. So it was maybe an area of, I don't no, know. It, it, no, that's true, they were not. But yeah. the military-industrial complex is different than the military. It is. Yeah, the military-industrial complex exerts its force. Political action committees. We got jobs in your district. You know, it, it, it's a works program. Yeah. That's how they operate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But and they 45. know how to do that. I think the F-35. Well, yeah. I think the Lockheed yeah. has 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 work <laughs> stations yeah. for the F-35 in every single district oh, in the country. Yes. Yes. Right. And that's, and, and that's alarming, and because Congress is now AWOL, they don't do anything. Right. They, 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 it's on, it's on cruise control. Presidents do make decisions that affect the other country. They do make decisions, yeah. but it's all it, it, the same thing. It's like, okay, we had J Lyndon Johnson. We, you know, Kennedy says, well, we, we would have got out of Vietnam. No, we wouldn't have got out of Vietnam. LBJ, Nixon, the same thing. Congress repeals the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Nixon continues it on. It's always the, the, the presidents did the same. From Kennedy, you know, he started out with a thousand advisors. By the time he was killed, they had sixteen thousand. It's still escalating. You have all these statements. Well, he was he was going to withdraw, but then he said, "Oh, but I can't do it until the '64 elections come." Meaning, it's a political decision. I can't do it right now. We really, really, really had done it at all. And LBJ is the same thing. He ran in '64. Hey, Goldwater's the crazy guy. As, he, as he's planning Operation Rolling Thunder to you know, escalate. Right. So and this is, it's, all, it, it's all built into this empire mentality. So it doesn't make any difference who the president is. Correct. Until, right. we, until we get separation of powers, until it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah, exactly yeah. right. I, well, I can see where you're coming from, but right. they well, do they, seem to have some authority. What? So presidents do seem to have some authority. Right. We're no, talking about but let's give an right. example. Trump comes in, he says, I don't want to be president of the world. Oh, I don't. Afghanistan is terrible and whatever. But he's get out. He doesn't, get, he doesn't stop a single war. And he drops bombs, the mother of all bombs. And so it's the same when he left, when he began. And yet he campaigned and said, oh, I don't want to be the ruler of the world. Who are we talking about? Trump. He was talking about Trump. Yeah, by Trump. Trump started wars? No, no. Okay. Trump we're, continued all the... We're getting off the... Yes. Okay. So let, we've got to stop, but uh, yes. I appreciate everyone coming out, and uh, I highly recommend you read this book. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Very good.